Hi, we're back. So in the last video, we were working on these servos and the general look and feel of these connecting arms. And I said I would apply that to the other side of the bike. Looking over here, we can see that I did. So let's take a quick look at how it works. I'm just going to select this object so I can get my, uh, my control that I built. Uh, that way I can deselect the object and I can then move it around without having to see the lines or the selection at all. So that looks pretty good. You'll also notice that I added a sort of a cross member here for strength but I haven't actually done anything to it. At this point I believe that's still just a cylinder and we can probably start by tweaking that a little bit. take a quick look at this object it's got 12 rotation segments probably want to bring that down to 10 it's also got caps on it we don't need caps on it right now so we can turn those off the next thing I'd like to do is to rotate it so it's more in line with where it's mounted sort of like that then we can just move it in a little bit and, to be honest, forget about it for now. It's not a very important part. It's just a little something extra that I wanted to add. So, these servos are a bit of a dangerous spot for me. I sometimes add detail to parts of these bikes where no one will notice. And I'm afraid of doing that with the servo. So, let's just leave them as a cube for now but we still need a way to mount them to the bike. It may seem unnecessary to create a mounting bracket, but I've found that if you do your best to try to sell the effect, the viewers of the model really appreciate it. We can do that by starting with this object itself. So the first thing I'd want to do is not use the symmetry object. I'm just going to take my servo gearbox cube, control C for copy, control V for paste. So now I have another one. It's still got a cylinder as its child. I'll just delete that. Now we can take this servo gearbox object from the side and just make it a little bit smaller than the actual servo gearbox is. Go to the top view, make it a lot thinner, sort of the thickness that a mounting bracket would be. If we want to get down to it here, that's actually uh, 0.29 inches. So let's make that a nice even 0.25 and call it a quarter inch aluminum plate. This model is roughly to scale. It's not perfect, but it's close enough that I'd, that I'd call it to scale. At this point, we can t we can see that this this bit of shroud left over from the model is getting in our way, and it doesn't really do us any good. I can just make sure nothing else is attached to that object, and it's not. So we can get rid of it. Go back to my shaded view. Now we can sort of see how we'd like to mount these. Now, considering I just deleted the shroud on this side. In an earlier video, I think I deleted one on this side. There's really no reason we can't keep this in the symmetry object. So I'm going to go back on my word. And let's select the servo gearbox. Reveal it in the object manager. And paste the bracket in. It's probably a good time to name it. And we can delete history. Make it editable. I'm mixing my Maya terminology with my Cinema 4D terminology. I know some folks will get angry at that. I'm just going to extrude one of the faces of the cube up like this, and we can sort of see where it needs to meet. Once we're here, we can go freeform a little bit. I know that I'd like it to follow the contour of the bike up here. And I'd also know that I'd like it to be sort of a Y-shaped bracket, so sort of a dip in the middle like that, which tells me I need to start slicing it. So I'm going to go to the knife tool, 
select the loop mode and make one single cut right down the middle. Moving back up to this view, I'm actually going to go to wireframe and it's really difficult to see, but right here is the part of the frame that uh, where the frame bows outwards the most. And that's where I want my edge to be. So, in this view, let's see if we can, there we go. We can just slide that edge. So, using the slide tool, you just move it up to there. So it's more in line with it. Select the edge. Go back to the shaded view. And we can see that we can now move it up. So that's a good spot for it to be in, but I don't want a big solid hunk of aluminum. I want it to look like it was sort of planned. Right now it just happens to fit. What we'd also like to do is move this front edge in so that it also follows the contour. So what we now have are three edges that sort of roughly follow the frame. And this is all really rough, but that's okay because the next step is that we are going to move it around some more. I'm just gonna go to edge mode using my rectangular selection and I'm gonna select all these edges. We can then do a bevel like that and we can sort of see how we're gonna get our Y shape now. we can move this centerpiece up a little bit and then start sliding edges around again. Let's see if we can get inside of the object. There we go. So I'm going to use the slide tool again. Slide it over. This is where I like four views so I can see what I'm doing from the side. So we can slide that edge over slide this one forward a little bit, a little bit more, and then we can delete these faces right here. Now once those faces are deleted, I like to patch it up as soon as possible, so let's do that. Using the bridge tool in edge mode, I can just bridge one, two, three. So we still have our nice geometry here, but it's now more of a organic shape. I'm going to select these two polygons at the top, switch to the side mode, and extrude them some more. I'll leave it at that. I'm going to let the viewer's imagination fill in the blanks of how these are actually connected. I won't actually bolt them onto anything just going to move these edges so that they line up flush. Or a little bit more flush than they are, let's say. This part of the frame is very concave, so we don't want to go overboard. So we've got something that kind of looks like a bracket now, and we can round it off a little bit. So let's make just the bracket visible. It's a much more organic shape, but it looks more convincing. So I'm going to select these two edges, and using the bevel tool, create end gongs. I want to keep the geometry nice and clean. Like that. And I'll do the same to the top part here. In this video I'm making a little bit more effort to be more gentle on my keyboard. I realize that it's really easy to hear in the other videos. So I'm working on that. I'm also 
using the contextual menu right click whenever possible instead of using a keyboard shortcut because I figured it does better for a demonstration. And we can also select these edges down here and then we can just bevel them all together and we get something that looks more like a bracket. This geometry right here bugs me though. Where these three edges converge, I don't like that at all. So what I normally do when I encounter some geometry like that is I fix it right away. Because if you don't, it'll just get worse. In Cinema 4D, I like to select all these edges and then melt them. They all go away. However, at this point, your N-GON triangulation can become a bit of a mess. So, we really need to put our foot down and figure out what they should triangulate like. Let's see. Let's go to polygon mode with the knife tool in line mode. Only visible things. Start dividing them up. And try to keep it quads. Quads are easier to work with. They subdivide better when you're going to do hypernerbs or a smoothing operator. They deform better. There's really few things that quads don't do very well. And here's an interesting thing. We have the choice of either quadrangulating it like that. This is not a very good shape or leaving it like this, in which case it's an okay shape. So I'm going to go along with the C4D select suggestion here. And I'm just going to use this shape. So I can then um, I forgot the command. Remove endgons. There we go. I usually do the shortcut. So UE does the same thing. We can then select the edges and bevel or not. I'm going to leave it unbeveled for now. What I will do is adjust the smoothing angle. So we get that hard edge. But I don't want to make it so hard that this isn't smooth. So I'm thinking something around 60 will probably do the trick. So we have mounting brackets. If we turn everything back on, you can see that the servos actually look like they're mounted to the frame now. Hurrah. OK. We can move on to something more fun. Let's talk about the hydraulic kickstands. This is a good one. So I'm going to get my content browser up. And let's take a look at this sketch I did. I'm, I'm a little bummed that this is the only sketch I have. I should have done a few more. So here are the hydraulic kickstands. They don't talk very much about the hydraulic kickstands. They're used as a storytelling vehicle. So there are lines in the book that say that the machines roared up and the hydraulic kickstands sort of um, extended, steadying the motorcycle. And there are a couple of scenes like that. We know that it has hydra hy hydraulic kickstands. And we know that a motorcycle and a kickstand can be kind of an unstable thing. So I was thinking, these kickstands will probably want to work equally good in soft grass as a concrete parking lot. So I started to think of the ski pole. I've never actually seen a ski pole in real life, but from the TV and cartoons and the movies and everything, it seems like it's sort of a cylindrical shape. So let's just get a cylinder going. And all of my objects at this point are going to be really rough. I'm going to stick to the primitive objects and I'm not going to put a lot of work in modifying the objects and making them perfect because they might change. So we're just going to use proxy objects at this point. Make it a little bit bigger. 
we have our ski pool section down there. And that's what I was thinking, sort of a sort of a disc, so that if this kickstand were to go down in grass, it wouldn't just sink right in. That's fine and everything, but it doesn't really seem dystopic novel caliber. I think what we need is a spike at the end, or multiple spikes. These would be hardened steel of some sort, and sure, they'd get blunt after a while, after they're deployed on concrete a few times. But the idea is that these machines are described as not only effective, they're actually described as pretty damn intimidating. And this feels intimidating. So let's let's go overboard with this. Let's take the cone. I don't think I've used a cone primitive ever. And the array object. Now, as usual, I'm going to group the cone because I like having my objects in groups. It just makes it a lot easier to deal with. And then I'm going to transfer my array to the position of the cylinder. Now the array starts off with a predefined radius. I like to remove the radius and control that using this null structure. We scale our cone up. Ah. There we go. That's what I wanted. So now it feels like I'm actually interactively moving the cones. These cones don't need to be very high resolution. Probably three height segments, 12 rotation segments, oriented negative Y. And I feel like there only needs to be about three copies. No, two copies, three in total. You can then scale them up a little bit. You don't need a cap on it. It would be scary enough if the cone just sort of poked out like that. But what's even scarier, I think, is if they splayed out at an angle like that. That's actually pretty intimidating, if you ask me. It may not be amazingly effective, but it's intimidating. So let's tone it down a bit. We have some nice spikes in case the machine is on a surface that's kind of slick. So we can actually get some grip. But they're not huge. And we have this plate that could be a little bit bigger, just so it doesn't sink into grass and stuff. Now, three cones look really cool and everything, but it may just be better to have one cone in the center. Let's leave it like this for now. I'm thinking the diameter of this is probably going to be like a, like a half inch. There we go. And we have something that I think looks pretty, pretty scary. So that's one of our hydraulic kickstands, at least the start of it. Now, if these were on my bike, I'd want them deploying at sort of an angle like that. And I think they should have the ability to lift the machine off the ground. And they should probably lift the rear wheel, not the front wheel. That way they can do scary things like lift the rear wheel and keep the rear tires spinning or something. 
Should they be angled backwards a little bit? I think so. That way, if the bike is still rolling when it comes to a stop, they don't uh, they don't create that sort of bouncing effect that you get if you stick something out in front of you. They get a dragging effect because they're angled backwards. This will also ensure that they lift the back of the bike and not the front. So that's good. And there was another mechanism that I thought was pretty important. But I'm not quite sure how to describe it, so I'm just going to make it. I started to think of it because all the surfaces this machine stops on are not going to be flat. Some of them are going to be at different angles. Uh, side to side, left, left, left to right, I mean. So if this machine stops on a surface that's uneven, the, the hydraulic kicks down on one side, might extend more than on the other side. And that's one way of handling this. But I started to think of other ways it could be handled. So this is this is fully extended. So it would need to be long enough for it to retract like that. And then fully extended would be about there. These are some serious pieces of hardware. I'm not sure where they're going to go. If they could be that far in board, it would be nice because they would retract all the way up. They wouldn't really affect the lean angle of the bike very much. But I don't think we can just push them up into the swing arm like that. Let's, let's organize these objects a bit and then we can get back to it. So I'm going to call that RAM. I'm going to call that Piston. It's going to be Spreader Spikes. Okay. So we have a RAM. Let's put it in a symmetry object so we can visualize this a bit better. As usual, I'm going to group it, but I'm going to create a new null object first. So it's at the center. We can move the null and symmetry group back here, and then we can put the RAM in it. Now we have a pair. We're seeing another problem, which is that they're, they're down there touching. Or maybe that's not a problem. Let's see where this goes. What if they were touching? What if they arched over the drive chain. Now, there's, there's just no space for it. It looks like they need to be further apart from each other. I mean, one thing's for sure is that that'll, that'll offer a lot of stability. And this is where my thought process came to that idea I was telling you about. Or, that I was alluding to. If we mount these right here in the frame, so there's a bracket or an eyelet or something that's welded on the frame, that would work pretty well. They could, well, they'd need to be lower if they were to fully extend and lift the bike. They would need to be about down there. So this would work. Only problem is that when they retract, they'd be sticking out there and they'd really ruin the handling characteristics of the bike. Because I'm just going to call these kickstands. Because if the bike leans over, let's see how much let's see how much lean angle we have before we have a problem. Twenty degrees. That's nothing. 32, it's more like a 38. Okay. 
what if our kickstands could so I'm going to group this and then move the origin of it so I think I can hold down L in R13 yep move the origin up there so now I can rotate it and we can see that if we were to rotate them in sort of collapse them like, like that we can get them out of the way and we can almost get the handling characteristics of our bike back the other way these could work is that they can actually start up and then they flip down and extend now we just have to figure out which one looks better so having them pointed up that's a weird rotation Let's see what happened there oh well, of course so let's put our bike back up so having these kickstands pointing up would work I'm actually going to I I like the kickstands at this angle for when they're deployed so what I'm going to do is make this null object rotation zero that way we can go to and from zero also it means if we mount them in this sort of orthographic orientation when they flip up they still point backwards I think that's actually pretty cool that's that's a good way for us to keep them um, in, in view so they look menacing and also deployable as kickstands what else would work at this angle what if we what if we were to rotate them back like that it seems like the more sensible way to do it I feel like the bike might still have a bit of problems cornering unless we put them all the way up like that and that would add some complexity because they would actually need to they need to have they would need to be able to actuate themselves like this and they would also need to rotate on some sort of a hinge can they face forward forward offers us the best use of space I think the problem with forward is that ground clearance sort of becomes an issue as you swing them around let's see I'm gonna think about this one I think I'm gonna end this video here so we know what our pneumatic kickstands are going to look like we just don't really know where they're going to go so I'll spend some time thinking about that and I will see you guys in the next video